Good evening. Whoa. Uh, it's nice to see you all here tonight. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, we'll let the last few people sort of trickle in, and I assume this, uh, you know, this being COS, everybody assumes things start at 10 after. Uh, so uh, all of our classes start at 10 after, so, you know, students will show up at, well, I guess they'll come at 11 after sometimes, but uh, it makes us look good, right? Yeah. So um, thank you all for being here. Uh, as uh, many of you have come to expect, this has really turned into an extraordinarily uh, uh, great event. We, we do twice a year, and then it's, now we've expanded it into the full CHAP program, uh, where now we're bringing speakers in all the time. But the, um, the sort of keystone kickoff event was when we started doing these, and I've, I'm starting to see so many of the same faces that I know that... Uh, 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 people in the community are, are, are uh, starting to look forward to this, and that's great. That's what we had hoped when we started this all these years ago. And uh, there are a couple of people who are uh, really important to making sure that this happens. Probably the most important is the guy who's still working right up there in the white shirt named Tim Foster. <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. He's, uh, he's in charge of the COS Foundation, and, and really without his leadership and uh, continuing um, guidance, uh, this wouldn't be fo possible for, uh, for me to pull off, because I think those of you who know me know I shouldn't be left in charge. Of, uh. <laughs> so uh, I'd also like to thank our Board of Trustees, which has done a, a really good job of shepherding COS all these years, especially through these tough economic times and making sure that we still got to function like a college uh, through the worst of these times. And uh, certainly one of the men uh, most responsible for that is in the audience today. So uh, John Zumwalt here uh, from the Board of Trustees. And he's also a history lover, so we, uh, we like him. Uh, <clears throat> And then finally, a couple of key people in COS administration. There's somebody who has, uh, almost from the beginning of her tenure here, has taken us under her wing and, uh, and shepherded through and just done so much, including handling a crisis we had, uh, a tragedy we had uh, over the weekend to make sure that this all goes off. And so I'd like to, I'd like to thank Christine Stanton. Uh, she's just been fantastic. Uh, we're, we're thanking her this year, but she, or, or this time, but she's really been, from the time that she showed up here, she's always been uh, one of our biggest supporters uh, uh, in administration. And then uh, finally, the people who pay for it, uh, the, uh, the evil Koch brothers, uh, are they uh, not evil to me, uh, the, uh, and this is going out on YouTube, so you should know, I, I, I think they have a sense of humor about that. Uh, but this is uh, funded by uh, a, a grant from the Koch Foundation. So uh, for those of you who would like to know who's behind the conspiracy, um, it's me. Uh, uh, I am the face of evil in the 21st century. Uh, <laughs> I, I said, I'm printing up T-shirts that say the establishment, in case those of you who are anti-establishment are looking for a target, that would be me. Uh, you can tell by the blue blazer. Uh, just screams establishment, doesn't it? Uh, so uh, they've been fantastic to work with. And uh, despite uh, what your image might be of the Koch Foundation, I can tell you that the only thing they have ever said to us is we just want something, um, we just want something that, uh, that, uh, that celebrates sort of what's good. Uh, and you put on a quality program, and you know what to do. So I've been given uh, carte blanche, really, uh, and they've never, they've never insisted on any political or ideological tests uh, for, uh, for this grant, you know, kind of, like I say, despite what you might have heard. Uh, they've, never, uh, they, they've never interfered at all. Uh, so with all of that said, uh, we're very happy to have uh, Professor Stephen Knott here tonight. Uh, coming to us all the way, flew out of Boston, uh, coming to us all the way from Newport, Rhode Island at the Naval War College where he is a professional, uh, professor of national security affairs. Uh, he will be speaking tonight on his latest book. Uh, those of you who don't have it yet, I highly recommend it and it is coming out in paperback soon. Uh, 
it's uh, tearing up the charts over here at our bookstore, <laughs> and uh, uh, called Washington and Hamilton, and uh, it, it, this will also be the subject of his his talk the, this evening. Uh, the uh, Washington and Hamilton, the alliance that forged America. Following his lecture, we will have a moderated question and answer session where you'll see some kids or young young adults uh, in green uh, gray uh, t-shirts who will uh, pass out and collect note cards for you to write questions on uh, and uh, ask any questions that you have a professor not so I would encourage you to take notes and uh, it, and it really if you if you do have any questions we'll do our best to answer as many of them as possible uh, at the end uh, and also I, I He's such a photogenic man. He, I already saw people taking selfies with him. Uh, uh, relatives. Yeah, relatives, yeah. Uh, and uh, if anybody wants uh, uh, him to autograph their book, if you brought his book with you, I'm sure he'd be happy to do that as well. So uh, as I say uh, every semester, no one is here to uh, hear me talk. So I present to you Professor Stephen Knott. Thank you all very much. Uh, thank you, Stephen. Your hospital, you and your family have welcomed me with remarkably open arms. Uh, thank you, Tim, and to all the COS folks who made this evening possible. I'm very grateful, very happy to be here. I actually have already spoken to three different classes and was, was very impressed with the interaction I had with the students. So you're doing a lot of great work here, and you should be very proud. Um, so what I'm going to talk to you about tonight is uh, what I believe to be the most critical relationship uh, of the founding of this country, and that's the relationship between George Washington, who you're all you know, fairly familiar with, and Alexander Hamilton, who I think most folks are less familiar with, although he's recently experienced something of a, of a professional rebound with this very popular musical on Broadway that sort of uh, recounts his, the trials and tribulations of his life. Um, an exceptional person who, unfortunately, until recently, I think has not received the credit that he is due. Um, so these were two very, very different men. George Washington grew up in a relatively comfortable world as a member of the Virginia gentry. Um, Alexander Hamilton grew up, he was born on the island of Nevis in the Caribbean, spent his first eight years on Nevis, and then he and his mother and his brother moved to St. Croix in the US, what is now the US Virgin Islands. Uh, I mention Hamilton's upbringing because it could not have been more dysfunctional. Uh, Hamilton's father abandoned him at a very, or abandoned his family at a very early age. Uh, and it, I'll avoid or spare you the details, but essentially due to the law at the time, Hamilton was considered an Ill illegitimate or bastard child. And he sort of carried that stigma with him for his entire life. And I'll, bring, I'll give you some examples of that later. He was constantly trying to overcome this perception uh, that he was not quite good enough. And so his whole life, in a way, was devoted to proving people wrong and to proving that he could be the best at whatever it was that he pursued, whether it was in the military or in public life or whatever. Um, so you have these two remarkably different men, 23 years apart in age. Washington was uh, old enough to be Hamilton's father. Um, they actually uh, do not meet until the, the, uh, they meet in early 1777. So it's still the fairly early stages of the American Revolutionary War. And I argue, and my co-author and I argue in this book, that thank God, because without those two sort of crossing paths, we believe that not only would the American Revolution probably have not been successful, uh, 
we think we're on stronger ground in saying that the new American government that was created as a result of the victory in the revolution under the U.S. Constitution, none of that happens without the presence of these two. And none of it happens without the two of them cooperating and basically seeing eye to eye on the great issues of their day. What I just said to you is something that would not be shared by all historians. In other words, they would tend to argue, many of them, that the key relationship of the founding era was between Thomas Jefferson and James Madison, both from Virginia, or perhaps Thomas Jefferson and John Adams, who had a falling out at a certain point, but at other times in their lives cooperated with one another. So in some ways, the, if there's a kind of radical element to the thesis of our book, it's this idea that, no, it was not Jefferson and Madison or Jefferson and John Adams. It was, in fact, George Washington and this so-called illegitimate immigrant from the Caribbean that really made the American experiment as we know it today. Uh, and so that, I think, is a different take than you'll get from most histories of this era. And it's, it's remarkable that Hamilton and Washington were able to bond because, as I said, they could not have come from two more different backgrounds. Hamilton was basically born into poverty and into dysfunction. Washington into a fairly comfortable existence as part of the Virginia gentry. 23-year um, age difference, just so many differences. And yet they managed to sort of put those differences aside for what they considered to be the national interest. Um, and uh, in my view, this is a pretty remarkable story. Let me try to just sort of give you the narrative of how their lives unfolded. So I mentioned to you that they meet in March of 1777, which is sort of well into the American Revolutionary War. Uh, and they meet in the area around New York City, which has just seen one of the worst military fiascos in the history of the United States. George Washington came very close to losing his entire army at the Battle of Long Island in August 1776. If not for a fog that rolled in at just the right moment, Washington's entire army would have been captured by the British, and that, I think, for all practical purposes, would have been the end of the American Revolution. If for that revolution to succeed, Washington had to keep that army intact. Even if they kept getting beaten, as long as they survived, as long as they stand, were still standing upright, the British still had a serious problem on their hands. And this almost came to an end within five weeks of the Declaration of Independence being issued. So July 1776, the Declaration of Independence. August 1776, the Battle of Long Island, which was an absolute rout of the American forces. However, Washington does manage to save his army. Due to this fog rolling in at a critical point, he was able to pull his forces off of Long Island and retreat into New Jersey. Hamilton is part of this retreat as an as a, uh, artillery captain uh, for a New York artillery company. He provides a lot of the covering fire that allows the American forces to retreat successfully. And then a few months later, as I said, in March 1777, is when Washington says to him, I need you on my staff. I need you as part of my military staff. Um, Hamilton was kind of reluctant to take it because he preferred to be in combat. He preferred to be in action, not a staff officer back in the headquarters. But Washington saw something in Hamilton that he really admired. And it seems to have been this, this capacity for work. I mean, Hamilton was able to work around the clock and uh, defy sort of the laws, the normal laws of uh, you know, the necessity for sleep. Um, just an incredibly hard worker, brilliant mind, quick mind, uh, and the two of them bond, bonded quickly uh, because Hamilton had an ability to almost um, guess what Washington wanted to be included in the many orders that were constantly being sent out from Washington's headquarters. No computers, no phones, no electronics of any kind. Everything was written. And Hamilton was the guy that ended up, along with some other staff officers, 
writing all of Washington's orders out for him. And again, he developed very quickly a tendency to sort of know where his commander in chief wanted to go next. You know, he knew his mind. So uh, it was an incredible bond in that headquarters from March 1777 uh, up through the end of the war itself. Um, they had one period during the war where they sort of broke. Um, I mentioned to you how Hamilton was anxious to see combat and didn't necessarily like the idea of having to work in the headquarters. Uh, he kept pushing Washington for some type of combat role. And Washington said, no, I can't do that. I need you here. You're too important to. Finally, at the Battle of Yorktown, which is one of the final concluding uh, conflicts of the war, Washington gave Hamilton his combat command. But in the months leading up to that battle at Yorktown, Hamilton actually got so frustrated with Washington's unwillingness to let him go fight uh, that, he, that he packed up and went home. Um, and this was after an exchange of words between the two, where Hamilton, to be, all, to be honest, didn't really act in a very mature fashion. Uh, but that was the one falling out that they had in an otherwise very close, professional, military relationship. Now, the problem was that even though the United States then had won the American Revolution, the fact was that our, our, the system of government, if you can even call it that, that we had at the time was called the Articles of Confederation. For people like Washington and Hamilton, the Articles of Confederation were um, a joke. Um, they had been unable during the war to provide the basic supplies, to provide the troops that were needed to actually conduct a war. I mean, the way we sort of fought the American Revolution was basically running a war by committee. And if any of you have ever served on a committee, even a school bake sale, you know that that's not necessarily the most efficient model to conduct any sort of endeavor, never mind a war. So they come out of that war, they meaning Washington and Hamilton and some of the other officers who had fought in that war, determined to try to make some changes to the system. But the problem was that a lot of the American people were very suspicious of any attempt where you might talk about consolidating power giving more power to some sort of central authority, which is sort of what Washington and Hamilton were all about. So uh, it, took, it took time for a kind of consensus to begin to build that perhaps we really do need to move beyond the Articles of Confederation and at least reform them, tweak them somehow, especially in the area of national security. This is big for both Washington and Hamilton. So. Um, you get to a situation by 1786, 1787, where there's really a considerable amount of discontent towards this structure called the Articles of Confederation. Hamilton leads the drive along with James Madison to call for a national convention, which ultimately meets in Philadelphia in Independence Hall in 1787. One of the key things you have to remember about that Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia is if Washington had not participated it's very unlikely that it would have been a success. Not that he contributed all that much, in fact, he barely spoke, but he presided over the Constitutional Convention and merely by his presence, he lent credibility to the proceedings. He was the only figure, the only person at the time that any American, whether they lived in Georgia or New Hampshire, um, would have recognized the name. Well, I, I'll take that back. They, they, they would have known the name Benjamin Franklin, many of them. But Benjamin Franklin, I think, was 81 or 82 at this time, which was considered ancient back then. So without Washington's presence, you don't get that sense of uh, legitimacy. You don't, you don't have that sense of legitimacy. And this is where, this is one of many instances where we can argue without a doubt that Washington was the indispensable man. He was indispensable during the war itself, not that he was a great general necessarily, but merely by keeping that army alive, as I said to you earlier. 
He was indispensable at the Constitutional Convention by sort of just merely being there, which reassured his fellow Americans. And then he becomes indispensable as being the first president and putting some meaning into those words in the Constitution. You know, what does it mean to be the president of the United States of America? He allays the fears of the public towards this new central government, and there was a lot of fear. So Washington's presence is critical. Hamilton, along with Madison, leads the charge to, to uh, have this constitutional convention. Hamilton, as a member of the convention, was not necessarily a key moving force because he was a delegate from New York State and he was outnumbered. The other delegates from New York State were not keen on creating a new form of government, so they constantly outvoted him. So he was isolated, but he was active. And then, as I said, Washington's presence lending legitimacy to it. The Constitution, as you all know, it, it, it is ratified, but it was a heck of a battle. And again, even here, Washington, he's not out campaigning for ratification of the Constitution, but he's writing letters, and it was known to the American people that he favored this reform, if you want to call it that. He favored this new Constitution, and that helped with the ratification, which was a close call. The new government is created in uh, 1789. Washington is, is inaugurated in March of 1789 as the first president. And one of his first appointments is to appoint his former military staff officer, Alexander Hamilton, as the first secretary of the treasury. Now, it's kind of a remarkable thing because in 1789, Hamilton was uh, 32. Uh, so all, everything I've told you up to this point, this is a guy in his teens and 20s. I mean, he was really a prodigy. He was really a, a young man on the move, and people tended to recognize his talent. Washington appoints him as the first Treasury Secretary. They had the same kind of views on what this new national government should do, uh, particularly in terms of sort of rectifying the, um, what, one of the big problems of the United States, this will come as a surprise, was the debt that we had racked up during the Revolutionary War. I mean, enormous debt that we owed to some foreign governments and to some private individuals who had bought these bonds that had been issued. Hamilton's the guy as the first Treasury Secretary sort of gets the United States on its, builds a solid economic foundation, a fiscal foundation for the US government. And also I think we could safely say, whether you like this or not, he's sort of the father of American capitalism, which is one of the reasons why he's still kind of a controversial figure. Um, and Washington doesn't have necessarily the kind of uh, a, a deep understanding of economics that Hamilton had, but Washington did share the vision that Hamilton had of getting the United States credit house in order so that if we need to in the future we can borrow money like in a time of war for instance. And he also seems to have shared Hamilton's belief that it was important that the United States become an economic power so that we weren't subject to the uh, undue influence of countries like Britain and France who might be able to pull some economic strings to try to get us to do what they want us to do. So at first everything was going swimmingly uh, but what happens is that Washington appoints Thomas Jefferson from Virginia as the first Secretary of State. Now, in the first few months of the Washington presidency, Jefferson is serving as the American ambassador to France, basically. Uh, so he's not there for the first uh, six, seven, eight months or so of the Washington presidency. When Jefferson arrives from Paris uh, and takes up his post as Secretary of State, Hamilton and Jefferson do not know each other. They've never met. Washington and Jefferson sort of knew each other from being from Virginia and having served in the House of Burgesses in Virginia. But what begins to happen fairly quickly is you begin to see a real deep difference of opinion between Secretary of State Jefferson and Secretary of the Treasury Hamilton. And 
These differences of opinion in some ways Washington welcomed because he liked to hear conflicting views. But on the other hand, he became fairly quickly disturbed at the, I mean, these were deep differences, deep differences over the role of government, over the extent to which the federal government should be doing certain things. Hamilton had a tendency to look at the Constitution and read it somewhat flexibly. You know, if it says things like, uh, the, the federal government will have the power to regulate commerce. Well, maybe that means you need things like a national bank. Um, so you, 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 you sort of move from the particular and you generalize a little bit. Jefferson's attitude was if it's not explicitly stated in the Constitution, then the feds can't do it, period. So he was called, today they would, might refer to him as a strict constructionist in terms of how he actually interprets the Constitution. So they had very deep differences about how to interpret the Constitution, about the proper role of this new government, about the proper role of the presidency. Hamilton believed in a kind of expansive view of presidential power. In other words, if he's the commander in chief, then you know you need to read that sort of liberally and give him some discretion in terms of conducting not only war but perhaps foreign policy as a whole. Again, Jefferson much more, a little bit more on foreign policy, was a little closer to Hamilton. But on domestic matters, Jefferson was uh, dead set against Hamilton's agenda. And over time, Jefferson comes to believe that Hamilton is actually a threat. He's a threat to the new Constitution. He's a threat to, to the American people. Because Jefferson believes that Hamilton has these uh, kind of power crazy, this, this power crazy streak in him. He's a potential danger. I mean, Washington, okay, he's fine, but when Washington's off the scene, Jefferson believes that Hamilton's the kind of guy that could just seize power and maybe turn this country into some sort of military dictatorship. Um, and so a year or two into the Washington presidency, it's open warfare between the Secretary of State and the Secretary of the Treasury. And Washington is pleading with these guys to knock it off. Now, please try to get along. At the very least, keep your differences within this, I was going to say White House. There's no White House at this time. But you know, keep, it, keep it within the cabinet. That's not what happens. Jefferson begins to make his dissent sort of public. And, and by doing what he does is he actually has people write these newspaper editorials highly critical of what Hamilton is up to and ultimately highly critical of President Washington. And then Hamilton sort of punches back and he starts writing anonymously uh, responses to Jefferson's criticism. So now the warfare is broken out in the press. And that's when Washington really gets frustrated with the actions of uh, both of these men, although over time he comes to place more of the blame on Jefferson than Hamilton. I have to point out that one of the reasons Jefferson and Hamilton did not get along, despite the highfalutin constitutional interpretation of all of that, is they were just two completely different personalities. Hamilton was an immigrant who was, uh, as I said, and for Jefferson that was kind of an issue. Jefferson had a kind of nativist streak. He might be voting for Trump these days if he were alive. Excuse me for saying that. Um, uh, Hamilton was younger than Jefferson by, uh, let's see, by about 12 years or so. Uh, Jefferson, I think, was used to having people defer to him. Hamilton didn't defer to anybody. Um, uh, Jefferson's first memory was of being carried on a pillow by a slave, his youngest, his memory as a child. I don't know what Hamilton's first memory was, but I can guarantee it wasn't pleasant. As I said, he grew up in a highly dysfunctional environment. So they came from two totally different worlds. One was, I think, fairly comfortable, Jefferson. Hamilton's was not comfortable. Hamilton was very much a self-made man. Jefferson was a man of inherited wealth built primarily on slavery. And so you throw all of that mix into this cauldron. Plus, as I said, the issues being debated were critical. Like, they, were, they knew they were setting precedents. 
that God willing were going to last a century or two or maybe three, and that people would be looking back to them for guidance. So they understood the importance of the issues that they, that they were debating, and then you had this sort of personality clash. I should mention, by the way, Jefferson hated confrontation. So when they'd have these disputes in the cabinet room, Hamilton kind of relished it. He liked it. Uh, he liked that kind of give and take. Some people don't. Jefferson was one of those people who, who didn't like it. So Jefferson's technique was to tend to use surrogates to kind of do his arguments for him. So you throw all of that together, and you get this um, you know, pretty, pretty combustible, combustible mix. Uh, and then I'll mention one or two other issues where they just find it completely split. Believe it or not, one of the biggest forces that split these two men apart within the president's cabinet, keep in mind, they're both working for the president, was this whole question of whether we should, how close should we get to the French and the French Revolution. Jefferson looked favorably on the French Revolution for the most part. Uh, Hamilton thought it was a disaster and that it was going to degenerate into a kind of bloodletting, which it did. Um, so you had that issue. You had the National Bank, which I mentioned. We can talk more about that in questions if you want. Um, you just had, and then you had something called the Whiskey Rebellion, which sounds like it was a lot of fun, but uh, actually it was very unpleasant for the people involved, which was basically an excise tax that Hamilton's Treasury had put on the production of whiskey. Farmers in the western part of Pennsylvania who produced this stuff refused to pay the tax. In some cases, they violently resisted paying the tax. Hamilton and Washington marched this army, with Washington actually leading the march for a time, uh, to push, pull, uh, to suppress this rebellion. Jefferson thought the whole thing was a joke. You know, just who cares? You know, this is, this is big government. You know, why are you going after these poor farmers? Just leave them alone. Don't make such a big deal out of it. Hamilton thought it was a question of, are we going to obey the law or not? Are we a nation of laws or not? And so again, just two very different philosophical views. By 1794, the break is complete. And Jefferson leaves Washington's cabinet. I think he leaves in late 1793, if I got that right. Um, and this is where the American two-party system begins, right? You've got the Hamilton side, which became known as the Federalists, and you've got Jefferson's faction, which becomes known as the Democrat-Republicans, and then ultimately as the Democratic Party. So the American two-party system starts with this battle that occurs in Washington's cabinet. And again, let me just emphasize, Washington's doing his best to try to get these two to work with each other. But by 1793-94, uh, Jefferson has had it. He's seen that Washington tends to side with Hamilton more than he sides with Jeff, far more than he sides with Jefferson. So he says, I'm done. I'm gone. Washington's second term, Hamilton leaves the cabinet, but he's still the most critical advisor to, to President Washington, even though he's a private citizen at this point. For instance, Hamilton basically writes Washington's farewell address. Just, you know, most students have at least some familiarity with that address. Um, those are basically Hamilton's words. Washington edited it, but Hamilton wrote it. Uh, Hamilton advises Washington on one of the most uh, critical issues of his second term, which was a treaty uh, between the United States and Great Britain called the Jay Treaty, which was also incredibly divisive. Um, but Hamilton's basically the mastermind behind that. So Washington has come. By the end of his second, by, by his second term in the, in the White House, in the presidency, uh, to rely, I, I cannot overstate the extent to which Washington relies on Hamilton, who at this point is a private citizen. So the bond between the two by this point is complete. Now, I don't want to leave you with the impression that they were close friends. It was very much a professional relationship. Um, but I will say by the end, Washington dies in December 1799. By the end, there's genuine affection between the two. And I think we can almost say that Washington sees Hamilton as an equal. Now, Washington really didn't have a lot of friends. I mean, he was Washington. And uh, he went to a great effort to sort of, in some ways, keep 
a distance between himself and everybody. But Hamilton's about as close as you can get, I think, to saying that they were, they weren't friends, but they, they had a close bond that was primarily professional, but over time grows into a more personal bond between the two. Uh, when Washington dies in 1799, Hamilton is devastated because he basically knows, Hamilton knows, that his career is over. Because Washington had protected him. Hamilton said that Washington was his shield. And it was true. Uh, because by this point, Hamilton has so many opponents on the Jeffersonian side, and James Madison has joined with Jefferson at this point. Um, without Washington's protection, he's basically done. And he was done. Accomplished a few more things. He lived until 1804. You probably know he dies in the duel. That's the one thing, two things people know. He's on the $10 bill, at least for now. Um, and he was killed in a duel in July 1804 by the sitting vice president, Aaron Burr. <laughs> kind of amazing. <laughs> Uh, so the sitting vice president kills the former secretary of the treasury. You think things are bad now in terms of <laughs> civility? Just take a look at the Burr-Hamilton duel. Uh, but uh, one of uh, Hamilton's final acts in terms of being of service to Washington is because of a certain fluke, which I'll spare you the details. Hamilton is responsible for organizing the state, the, the, the official memorial service for George Washington in the capital of Philadelphia. Uh, and he plunged into that effort with his usual zeal, organizing things right down to what kind of music's going to be played at the funeral, you know, who's going to speak, uh, what the marching order will be in the procession, just, just kind of remarkable. Final thing I'll say about what, the two, what these two men did and why I think they're so Im more important than any other founding figures um, first of all, as I said before, the American Revolution doesn't succeed without Washington, and Hamilton plays a significant role in that. Secondly, the Constitution itself doesn't, I don't think the convention is a success, and I don't think it gets ratified without Washington's presence, and without Hamilton's aggressive campaign to get his home state of New York to ratify the Constitution. New York was critical. And it was extremely close in terms of actually winning the ratification there. Um, I think they're responsible, for better or for worse, for creating a strong presidency. I actually, actually happen to think that's more of a positive than a negative. Uh, and I'll mention something I haven't even really touched on yet. But Hamilton was one of the founding members of the New York Society to abolish slavery. So Hamilton's record on slavery is far more, in my view, respectable or impressive than Jefferson's, for instance. And yet it's ironic because Jefferson is frequently portrayed as the champion of the common man. Well, I'm telling you, if you were a common African American or Native American back then, it didn't look that way. Hamilton and the Federalists had a far more progressive view of what should happen with slavery, i.e. it should be on the road to extinction, than a lot of the Jeffersonians on, on the other side. Washington was a large slave owner in Virginia, but by the end of his life, he's come to realize that a regime dedicated to the idea that all men are created equal should not be enslaving people by the hundreds of thousands. And so he takes a step that Jefferson and very few of Washington's Virginia contemporaries took which was to basically say in his will that his slaves will be freed uh, upon the death of his wife, uh, Martha Washington. But point being that Washington, by the end of his life, understood that this institution had to give. And in fact, one of Washington's closest advisors was quoted as say, quoted him, Washington, as saying that should it ever come to a conflict between the North and the South over slavery, Washington would throw his lot in with the North. I mean, that was a lot coming from a Virginia, a slave-owning Virginia. Final thing I'll say about the contribution that these two men uh, contributed to 
and it, we may take it for granted today, but we couldn't, shouldn't take it for granted in the 1780s and 90s. They convinced many of their fellow citizens to think of themselves as Americans. Not as Virginians, not as New Yorkers, Americans. And that was a radical idea in 1790, take your pick. Um, they, Hamilton, wrote frequently about this idea of getting Americans to think continentally, meaning think about your nation. Now Hamilton, that came easy to Hamilton because he wasn't born in the United States. He didn't think of himself as a Virginian like Jefferson did. You know, Jefferson in his letters refers to his nation. His nation was Virginia, not the United States. For Hamilton, it was the United States. And by the end of, by Washington late in his life, it's the United States. He's no longer a Virginian. And I think both Washington and Hamilton, unlike Jefferson and Madison, convinced their, their fellow citizens to think continentally, to think of themselves as Americans. And that was a remarkable achievement for a people and for a nation that prior to that had no concept of America or the United States of America. And so that's one thing I would urge you to sort of consider when you think about the contributions that Washington and Hamilton made to this country. I'm going to stop here because I'd rather answer questions from you. I've given you a kind of general outline of where this book goes and why I think these two deserve the credit uh, that they don't, particularly Hamil Hamilton doesn't always get. So thank you for your attention to this point. Charming, mean, thank you, Professor Knott. here is, uh, hopefully I turned myself down here, uh, uh, we should have some people running around with note cards. Uh, do we have note cards? Have they been distributed? No? <coughs> All right. Uh, okay. Got lots of notes cards. So if you'd like to ask a question, uh, 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 raise your hand or, or if, submit them in writing if you already have a piece of paper where your question is, was written down. And uh, these uh, fine young people will be collecting them and bringing them forward. Uh, so I, look, while we're waiting, uh, uh, host prerogative, what did you think of the Hamilton musical? Oh, uh, <laughs> it's extremely well done. Um, I was skeptical. I had heard about this thing in the works for years, that there was going to be a hip-hop musical on Alexander Hamilton. And I kind of thought, this is not going to go anywhere. I mean, how is this possibly going to work? And it works. Um, it's, it's remarkable. It's high energy. It's terrific. It's not cheap to get a ticket. In fact, it's next to impossible to get a ticket. I have a few quarrels with some of the historical inaccuracies in it, but only a nerd like me would be care, uh, concerned about something like that. Steve, is the book available? You had a question. Yes, the, bo book. the book is available in the COS bookstore. So uh, um, I, would, I, I don't know if the bookstore is still open, but uh, uh, I don't know if you can run it's, over there and buy one. On Amazon. Yeah. Yeah. It's not that expensive. Yeah. See, I see people feverishly writing their questions down. You're probably all aware that the Secretary of the Treasury has announced that Hamilton is going to be taken off the $10 bill. They're not, now they're saying he's not going to be taken off. He's going to be moved. I don't know what that means. And I, I certainly don't have an object, objection to a, a woman being placed in American currency. That's a great idea, but I'd prefer the 20 over the 10. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, so what are the best, what were your best or most fruitful sources on Hamilton? Well, all of the papers of the Founding Fathers are now pretty much available online. So um, I think the Library of Congress and the University of Virginia have these very aggressive website, aggressive is not the right word, but ambitious websites uh, where you can, you can find all of the correspondence of these folks online. So. Um, 
our job as historians is made, I'm not a historian, I'm a political scientist, but I act like I'm an historian, uh, is He's made jealous. quite easy by the presence of these documents online. So it was not as difficult as it might sound. And the more you get into somebody like this, you know, oh yeah, he wrote about this in that letter in 1783 or whatever. So uh, it's, it's actually pretty easy to sort of find the material that you need. This is actually my second book on Hamilton. So the more you get into somebody like that, the, the easier it becomes. And modern technology has certainly made it quite easy. So I don't know if I, I think I know who this is, but uh, you might know the name. Would you consider it to a debate with Clay Jenkins? Jenkinson. Oh, Jenkins, okay. Yeah. Uh, is that the Thomas Jefferson? Yeah, he's the guy who does, he does a terrific job. As, I'm not willing to put on, I probably could, should put on a powdered wig, but I'm not willing to go the powdered wig route, but I, I know Clay Jenkinson. He's smart. He knows Jefferson inside and out. Yeah, I'd love it. That'd be great. Yeah. That's a good one. Uh, did Hamilton ever think of, Je of uh, Washington as a father figure? Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, well, some people have speculated that Washington was, in fact, Hamilton's father. <laughs> kind of crazy, but because uh, Washington had actually made a trip to... Uh, the Bahamas, I believe, the only time he ever left the continental U.S. And Hamilton was nearby in St. Croix or whatever, or excuse me, Hamilton's mother would have been in Nevis. Uh, it's total garbage, but it's amazing how much life is given to that. Uh, there is some evidence that Washington did view Hamilton and all of these young military officers as kind of a part of his official family. And he did sort of think of them that way, but it wasn't just Hamilton. It was the whole young staff officer corps that uh, made Washington's life easier for him. So, It's an interesting. I've never even thought about this. but uh, Good questions, by the way. So, uh, uh, to what extent did Jefferson's years in France uh, color his views of Hamilton? Yeah. Um, they... They certainly influenced Jefferson's views about um, politics and about um, uh, revolution and revolutionary change. I won't, it's, it's hard to say Hamilton specifically, but Jefferson had a more idealistic view of human nature than Hamilton did. And this was partly due to the fact that in France he had seen this incredible disparity between you know, the court of Louis the... 16th, I guess, and the way the common folks lived in France. And so he absorbed some of that revolutionary zeal on the part of folks who wanted to end what they saw as a clear system of injustice. For Hamilton, growing up in a much more violent, unstable world, uh, he was just far less taken with the idea of change for change's sake. Uh, Hamilton favored stability and order over radical change. And by radical change with Jefferson, I mean, Jefferson actually wrote a letter once where he defended the French Revolution. And he said, look, if it ends up killing every man and woman in France, but spares, excuse me, but spares one man and one woman who could keep the species alive, that'd be okay. <laughs> in other words, that's the price you have to pay sometimes for change. Hamilton looks at that stuff and goes, oh my God. This is insane. Uh, and by the way, Jefferson wrote that when he was about 50 years old. This isn't some 22-year-old with a poster of Che Guevara on the wall. Uh, uh, did Washington and Hamilton ever disagree on anything of substance? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, as I said, most of the time during Washington's presidency, he would side with Hamilton. There was one instance where the revolutionary government of France had sent an ambassador to the U.S. And the question was, should we recognize this ambassador as the legitimate representative of the French government? Jefferson said yes, accept him, greet him, don't make a big deal out of it. Hamilton said no, you shouldn't. This is an illegitimate government. Uh, Washington went ahead and took Jefferson's advice on that one. And then there was one other issue surrounding a very obscure question about apportionment, how the representatives in the House of Representatives should be apportioned. Should it be one for every 30,000 or one for every 60? He followed Jefferson's advice on that, not Hamilton. But believe me, those were the exceptions. And it 
pissed Jefferson off, pardon the expression, to no end that his fellow Virginian was frequently listening to this illegitimate immigrant from the Caribbean. Uh, which leads directly to the next question. Given uh, Hamilton's background, how did he manage to establish himself in the first place on the mainland? Yeah. He, he was sent here. And he was, uh, so he had, a he had some benefactors in St. Croix, including a wealthy businessman who ran a, a, ran a kind of import-export business. And Hamilton worked for this guy. And yeah, Hamilton's like 14 years old, and he's running a business in St. Croix dealing with these ship captains who are bringing goods in from all over the world. It's kind of amazing. But these benefactors recognized the talents that Hamilton had. They raised money, including, a, I think, a Presbyterian minister in St. Croix, raised money to send Hamilton to the United States for a college education. And he first looked at what is now Princeton University. And he went to the chancellor of Princeton and said, I want to complete my degree in a year or something like that. And the guy said, no way. So he left there and went to what is now Columbia University, and they said, okay, we'll let you do it. So uh, he had these wealthy benefactors in St. Croix who sent him here. But it was, a, I mean, it, uh, just to clarify, they, they, they were just, they just recognized his talent. Correct. It wasn't that they weren't relatives of his. No, not yeah. at all. <laughs> not at all. Yeah. And as I said, one was a minister who thought he was doing a charitable thing by sending this penniless kid to the States. I like that sometimes these questions are so perfectly asked. What was Jefferson's problem with the bank of the central bank? <laughs> <laughs> How much time do you have? Yeah, yeah. Uh, he had a lot of problems with it, one of which was the Constitution didn't specifically state that you could create a national bank. And they actually had debated at the Constitutional Convention whether they should include a provision and they didn't. So Jefferson had a pretty powerful argument to make. But perhaps more importantly for Jefferson's concerns, he saw a kind of centralized financial institution as a vehicle for corruption. So if you create this national bank, which was going to be located in the national capital, in Philadelphia at the time, that's going to uh, distort the system. It's going to give more power to whoever actually runs this bank and whoever is sort of, um, whoever the sort of main supporters of it, they're going to be able to spread some of that money around and kind of crony, you know, cronyism that'll influence the system and distort things. It's the same kind of arguments you hear today, perhaps, against the Federal Reserve Bank uh, and also just Wall Street, that they, their ability to spread money around corrupts the system. And it's why people like Bernie Sanders and even Trump to an extent, are doing, doing pretty well. So there's always been that fear of centralized financial power. And for Jefferson, the National Bank was a symbol of that. Uh, another good, uh, his other book, which I also recommend, is Alexander Hamilton and the Persistence of Myth. Uh, so if those of you are interested more in the kind of perception of Hamilton, he digs deeper in, in, in that work. But uh, this is a good question I, I want, want you to uh, why do you think the British Empire never returned in an attempt to conquer the United States? Well, they did, in a sense, kind of return in 1812. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we, uh, well, I was going to say we started that war. I mean, they were, they were harassing our ships on the high seas. They were taking American sailors off our ships and putting them on theirs. You'd never see, me, see these guys again. Uh, and this was going on year after year after year. They were constantly harassing American shipping. So in 1812, the United States declared war on Great Britain because Britain refused to stop this practice, on, these practices on the high seas. Um, but so you could argue that the War of 1812 represented a second American Revolution, which is how it was seen by a lot of folks in the States. Um, and the British did attend, you know, they burned the capital to the ground. Um, but in fairness, the War of 1812 was always a sideshow for the British. Their main concern was Napoleon and the French. So they didn't quite try to come back and take us over, but they would have been very happy to have beaten the heck out of us, and they tried. Uh, uh, why didn't Hamilton win the duel? Yeah. <laughs> well, there's some controversy around this, but I mean, I'm of a belief, and I think 
you, you would too if you looked at all the evidence. Hamilton threw his shot away. Hamilton um, didn't want to necessarily engage in the duel with Burr, partly because Hamilton had lost his eldest son in a duel two and a half years earlier, which crushed Hamilton and his wife. So Philip Hamilton was his eldest son. He was killed in 1802. Alexander Hamilton dies in 1804 in this duel. Uh, but Hamilton, I believe, threw his shot away. Uh, Burr, Aaron Burr, the sitting vice president, uh, did not. But, you know, let me just say, I'm glad somebody asked this. There's been an attempt recently to sort of resurrect Burr's reputation. It's not deserved. <laughs> Trust me. I mean, Jefferson and Hamilton and Washington and Madison and Monroe and some of these others, they had their disagreements on almost every issue they can think of. The one thing they were all unified on was that Aaron Burr could not be trusted. He was not a man of principle, as they would say. He constantly had his finger in the wind. If public opinion was going one way, that's where he was. So this idea that somehow Burr has been maligned uh, throughout history, I mean, Burr deserves all the maligning he can get. Uh, <laughs> Is there anything in contemporary America that res resembles the relationship between Washington and Hamilton? Wow. Huh. Um, hmm. well, let me give it a little bit of background. He, he, uh, Pro Professor Knott also worked at the uh, uh, Miller Center in Virginia on the oral history project for the presidency. So he does have a background yeah. also in the modern presidency. Yeah, I'm trying to. That's a great. I mean, a lot of these elder statesmen in D.C. have a tendency to produce young followers who will also go on to be, I'm just trying to think of a good example. Uh, Maybe Cheney and uh, when he was first coming up and uh, Rumsfeld yeah, that's, or that's Ford. Yeah, that's not a bad one. I mean, Gerald Ford kind of, uh, for better or for worse, brought Dick Cheney and Donald Rumsfeld into um, prominence uh, as young men. Uh, I don't know. Henry Kissinger has some protégés younger protégés who have gone on to pretty significant careers in government. So, But none of those examples I just gave you, I think, would equal what happened between Washington and Hamilton, because these guys had both the, uh, the benefit and the misfortune, because it could have gone bad, could have gone wrong, of being there at the start. So they had, they had the chance to shape this system that you and I all still live in. It's changed a lot. Our toys have changed a lot. I mean, they didn't have iPhones or whatever. But they've still set the rules. The rule book was written by these guys, and they all knew it, which is why Jefferson and Hamilton battled so intensely. They knew they were setting some incredibly important precedents. And I think the precedents that Washington and Hamilton set were far more weighty than a lot of folks we could try to think of today, sort of young older mentors. So I'm going to ask this next, next one, and you can say pass. Okay. Right? Uh, we, we, but I, I just want to see how you'll answer it. Uh, on social issues, <laughs> would it have been fair to claim Hamilton was akin to a classical liberal and Jefferson a neocon? <laughs> uh, no, that's, that's not accurate. Uh, if anything, Jefferson was more the classical liberal. He's the small government type. He's the guy who believes that the government that governs least is best. He's got much more of a libertarian streak in him. He's much more of a pure free marketeer. Hamilton believed in what we would call capitalism today, but he was also thinking, well, there may be times when protectionism is in order. You may have to put up tariff barriers to protect young American industries. Uh, so in that sense, that's not accurate. The neo Jefferson, in a way, was a bit more of a, of, of a guy who believed in kind of meddling in external, you know, foreign affairs. Hamilton was more, Jefferson was more the idealist in foreign policy. Hamilton was the realist. If it's not in our national interest, don't do it. Jefferson's attitude occasionally, and I, I got to be careful with this because these arguments were very subtle. Uh, but Jefferson was a little bit more willing to say, well, if there's an independence movement, a freedom movement in France, we need to show our sympathy for it. I mean, maybe we don't intervene, but we need to be more assertive in recognizing that they're trying to do exactly what we did. Hamilton's attitude was, that's only going to tick off the British. 
we need the British. Yeah, we fought against them, but that's over. They're the big superpower of the day. It's a benefit to us to trade with them. Let's keep a good relationship with them. God bless the French, but they're on their own. No. So, so uh, it's hard to apply these contemporary labels to 220 years ago. Um, having said what I just said, yeah, yeah. the uh, um, I mean, even even calling. I was thinking about that. I don't know why it occurred to me, but we call them a capitalist, a term that hadn't been invented yet. Right. Right. Yeah, uh, so um, the. Uh, uh, Washington relationship aside, what, what are some of the prevailing myths surrounding Hamilton? Oh, my God. They're endless. I mean, they're absolutely endless. Um, one of the things, one of the myths that I tried to demolish in that first book I wrote on Hamilton, and you will still see this, and I guarantee if you go to home tonight and you Google, like, Alexander Hamilton and the Great Beast, he was allegedly quoted as saying that he considered the people to be a great beast. In other words, a mindless, you know not worthy of attention. He never said it, okay? But it lives on. Um, it was first reported in, you know, decades after he died. Um, and I, I guarantee if you go home tonight and you type that in, you'll find somebody who said, oh, Hamilton referred to the people as a great beast. He didn't. Uh, that's one example. Um, I've told Steve, this is gonna make- The question said, don't mention the cat. Oh, it did? Oh. <laughs> It's an inside joke, but f tell them about well, the Well, so in this play in New York City, this Broadway play that's the biggest show in years, um, they repeat something that's false, which it's not necessarily the director and the star of the show's fault, because he, he got it from a biography that he read on Hamilton, which includes this story. And the story is that Martha Washington, George Washington's wife, named her Randy Tomcat Hamilton because supposedly Alexander Hamilton was kind of a randy tomcat, you know, not faithful to his wife. So, and it's true that Alexander Hamilton did have an extramarital affair, which was exposed by the Jeffersonians. And again, talk about civility. Um, so we know that he had one extramarital affair, and I'm not standing up here excusing that as something that was good or whatever. Of course, it wasn't. Um, but this notion that he was a serial philanderer, that he was constantly on the prowl, uh, is part of this musical in New York City where at one point the character playing Hamilton, who's also the director, producer, Lynn manuel Miranda, turns to the audience and tells this little story that Martha Washington had named her, pardon the expression, horny tomcat after Alexander Hamilton. And then he pauses and he looks at the audience and he says, that's true. It's not true. Okay, the first time it ever appeared as a story was, again, mid-1800s in a piece where it, the, the, written in Great Britain, in which somebody also said that George Washington had 13 toes, one for each state, okay? <laughs> and the three, three extra toes had grown after the Declaration of Independence. <laughs> and then you get the Tomcat story, and it's being repeated as fact, not just in this musical, but in the most reputable histories and biographies of Hamilton that you can find. And, and people will even put it in a reputable history without a footnote or an endnote, because there's no legitimate footnote or endnote to put. But it's such a great story, they can't leave it out. And it's bogus. You can see I'm getting all pumped up here. About, you know. uh, what do you think Hamilton would make of our current financial crisis, in particular the debt? Oh, the debt? <laughs> well, he believed that a healthy, well-managed debt could be a plus, because it helps you establish a credit rating. I think he'd probably be a little upset at the size of our current debt, because uh, again, he emphasized sort of the well-managed aspect of it. Um, so I, yeah, I, I mean, yeah, always reluctant to say what he would think about a contemporary issue, but I can't You're imagine. You're going to hate the next question. Okay. I, I can't imagine he'd be comfortable with a $19 trillion debt. That's grown to, by the way, the first time we cleared a trillion in national debt was in the mid-80s. We've gone from one trillion in the mid-80s to 19 trillion today, what, 30 years? That's troublesome. Uh, 
and I think this is based on Hamilton's background as a, a, a immigrant, but what do you think Hamilton would have made of the current Syrian refugees? <laughs> yeah. Again, sticking my neck out where I probably shouldn't. I mean, in the end, he would say, you've got to let national interests dictate your policy. So compassion is great, but only to a point. Uh, you and I as individuals can engage in acts of combat compassion, but nations can't think the same way, I think he would say. And he would be somewhat receptive to ideas to try to restrict that flow, I think. Um, I'm, I'm struggling with the handwriting on this, but it looks like it's a good question. Uh, <laughs> it's beautiful cursive, believe it or not. Uh, although Hamilton was never president, do you think concept of leadership would have been favorable or I can't, I just can't. Uh, je, uh, I, let me just ask it uh, and say it's, uh, do, you think, I th do you think Hamilton would have made a good president? Well, believe it or not, I'm going to say no, because he was a great, as I said, when Washington was still alive, Washington uh, kept Hamilton's excesses kind of in a box. He was a moderating influence on Hamilton. Hamilton was not a great politician. Jefferson was a great politician. Jefferson was constantly outmaneuvering. Hamilton, there's a reason why the Democratic Party survived, and there's a reason why the Federalist Party died within 20 or 30 years. Part of that's due to the leadership differences. Hamilton was not a good sort of street-wise politician. Hamilton's idea was that if you debate policy, you actually get up in front of people and you have an honest debate and you tell them the, the stuff that even might bother them, because the truth demands it. That's not how you win elections. Right? You always sort of shade the truth a bit, and Jefferson was really good at that. Um, so he, uh, Hamilton was not a particularly effective politician, and I don't think he would have made necessarily, I don't think he would have made a good, a good president as, as a result. Um, so is it fair to say that the source of his influence was his intellect? Correct. That was the entirety of his power. And he had an incredible intellect. He, even. Jefferson had to admit that this guy uh, had one, he one heck of a brain. Uh, who were the shapers of Hamilton's political ideas? Huh, that's great. Yeah, we're not entirely sure because he was born in such an obscure place, but he did have access because of these wealthy patrons in St. Croix. He apparently had access to a decent library of what would be considered sort of political, excuse me, uh, yeah, political economy like books about the best way to, to uh, 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 create the most just economic systems. Um, uh, I could throw some names at you, but they barely mean anything to me, and I'm sure they probably wouldn't mean much to you, and I really don't know who half these people are, but uh, political thinkers of the day who thought primarily about economic matters, which was Hamilton's strong point or strong suit. So he, he was primarily self-taught which is remarkable. I mean, very little formal education, but a voracious reader. Even at the height of the American Revolution, when he would have been on his feet for 20 hours straight, sometimes even in combat, he would still be seen reading by candlelight, you know, at the end of the day when everybody else was just wiped out. Uh, so just a voracious intellect and an incredible ability to take theory and bring it down to sort of the... the the, the roots, the grassroots. So he might read some text about, you know, coinage and currency, how to set up a system of, of, of exchange. Uh, and he would be able to take it from up here and bring it right down to day-to-day -to -day life. And that, not everybody has that talent. He did. And Washington, of course, recognized that. There was a story in, uh, in your book about the... Uh, um, I, Reminded of two things. Number one, when we talk about the framers of his ideas, normally we would be including people who were teenagers, but by the time he was a teenager, he was in college. Right. Uh, so right. uh, it's strange to say, like, his political ideas were already formed when, yeah. at an age when most people are you know, playing video games. But 
in Hamilton's case, there's a story in, 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 uh, in your book about uh, his choice of college and the, the sort of political climate uh, influencing uh, his decisions somewhat. Is, if I, am I remembering yeah. that correct? Yeah, although you're catching me on something I haven't looked at for quite a while. But, yeah. Um, so what happens is just prior to the revolution, you have this split amongst people we would now call, or even then they were called Tories, who wanted to remain loyal to the crown and remain part of Great Britain. And uh, the Whigs, you know, the people who were sort of saying, no, you know, it's time for independence, it's time to cut the ties. Uh, and, and you began to see churches fall on one side or the other, and you began to see all the major institutions in the United States, or the colonies, fall one side or the other, including the colleges. So um, I believe that Columbia other than the fact that the president of Columbia was a Tory, the faculty tended to be sort of revolutionaries, which, by the way, they still are today for the most part. But, um, yeah, good question. Uh, was Washington slaveholding ever a problem for their relationship? No, and that's a good question as well, because there's a tendency now, due to the success of the musical and the book that it was based on by Ron Chernow, uh, I think to overstate Hamilton's abolitionism, yes, he was opposed to slavery. Yes, it appears that he did not own slaves himself. Oh, there's some dispute on that front, but I, I think he probably didn't. But I don't want to stand up here and, hey, or, and have you head out thinking that this guy was you know, fervently ab abolitionist. You know, this guy was the Frederick Douglass of his day. He was not. So he was willing to kind of push that issue aside, maybe thinking that in the long run, a stronger union would be able to get rid of this peculiar institution. But at the time he was alive, there were higher priorities for him than abolitionism. And that never really impaired that relationship he had with his slave-owning president. Any, any final cards that need to come in? I, uh, in the interest of time, I think we, sh we could cut it off. I should also thank, I, by the way, the people in the gray t-shirts are the COS College Republicans. Yes. And yes. Uh, they've been fantastic at facilitating all of these events. Here. In particular, the President Trent up there who has done everything. So thanks, Trent. Are there any final cards to come in? <laughs>